Thanks for having me. I wanted to say that if you're watching the recording of this presentation, uh, it will um, be posted on YouTube and we'll have the slide deck as well posted. But also get on my blog and send me a question. I did a presentation on another topic last month in similar fashion. And I had a lot of people inquire one-on-one uh, -on -one afterwards. So that's easy and I'll provide that contact information uh, at the conclusion. So I used to live and work in the 1990s in Dallas. And I actually, going back to graduate school, I did my thesis research at the Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth. I have a degree in 19th century American art history. So I have, uh, some experience in North Texas, and I really like it. I've talked at AFP DFW a few times. So uh, I haven't done that for the past couple of years, but I have really enjoyed it. And I know it's a really, really great community. I actually um, have also taught at the um, uh, CFRE review exam, uh, have helped do that. So have been up there a lot. Well, I'm very familiar with it and like it and love the donors up there. I've had some wonderful experiences. So uh, my background is more than 30 years now of hands-on major gift campaign experience across the Texas, literally from end to end. I hold two degrees from UT Austin and was elected in graduate school to the Honor Society of Phi Kappa Phi. And so given my university background, I have a lot of experience with research and writing, publications, communications. And with my art history background, I actually have a little bit of graphic design and video experience. So I'm kind of left-brained and right-brained at the same time. Uh, I've become known for uh, working on challenged, I would say, capital campaigns uh, with little or no staff, just digging in to those impossible campaigns that are definitely worthy, but seem to get stuck. And so my motto is never say never. And today I'm the volunteer organizer, the primary one, uh, with Nonprofit Tech Club Austin, which is a partnership with N10 TechSoup, our host today, and with our local startup hub, entrepreneurial hub, Capital Factory. And I'm also, through the Tech Club, I learned about QGive, gift processing, and so I'm an affiliate of QGive. I actually learned about it at the Tech Club, and then I recommended and installed it myself by hand for a nonprofit, and I just became wildly <laughs> fanatic about it. So you can ask me about that, too. Now, my academic training uh, has been very helpful for research and writing, but is it necessary? Well, I would say if you are focused, you're calm, you're determined, and uh, you can sit without interruption and conduct uh, meaningful research, you should be good to go. It, you don't have to have an advanced degree to do this work, but you do have to uh, have to have that mindset. Good habits to have if you're going to be a prospect researcher are, in my opinion, I read every day, read the news, follow trends. And I follow the stock market. I find that's one of the most important things that I've learned after all these years is to see what trends are happening in the stock market, who, what companies are on the upswing, which ones are on the downswing, <laughs> and other things. It's really helpful to identifying prospects in the long run. Now, I call this the online tools for inquisitive minds. I actually use Google News, but there are other services uh, for news alerts that you can get right to your inbox. I follow topics and people, and I uh, just request that those updates go directly to my inbox. So you can make it real easy on yourself by getting those alerts, and you can set them up daily, weekly, or monthly, whatever it is. So I recommend that. Um, that sort of helps ping me to say, hey, there's something going on with this person or this project. Um, and I think also today there's no such thing as being bored. How could you possibly be bored when you have the internet? It's just an amazing, amazing development and tool for us. So one thing that I do that is a little bit unusual, I think, is I um, read tax returns 
I get on GuideStar, and you know, your nonprofit's on GuideStar. So um, you're there and anyone can see your tax return and that is the law. But also private foundations are uh, nonprofits themselves. So their tax returns are on there. It's sometimes the best information about where they are right now and what they're doing are on, is on GuideStar. So I love to do that. And sometimes you need to reach out. There's no website, there's no mailing address, there's no nothing, but you might find it on the tax return. So that's really super helpful. And then I follow the business media. Uh, my favorite is Fortune, but also Forbes. Wall Street Journal does take a subscription, so that's a challenge. Bloomberg, you, Yahoo Finance, and my local business media. But you can um, usually get a lot, get the gist of information of what's going on by following your social media. And uh, so I recommend doing that all the time for the big picture. Uh, a lot of people think that social news outlets, you know, Hollywood coverage, stars, who's doing what are fluffy. And that's not really helpful, but really you can learn a lot from that. So I do keep an eye on it. It's not my primary focus, but really the top concerns and the philanthropists active today, locally, statewide, nationally, that can impact your project. You can learn not just who's funding what and who's endorsing what, but you can also learn how to pitch your own cause. And uh, they, the reason I say that's important is because they have messaging professionals in place who help them make those pitches. So I would definitely keep an eye on that and see. And sometimes you can also fit your local nonprofit in with a bigger project. Charity publications are very helpful. Uh, I like Stanford Innovation Review, but lately I really like Nonprofit Pro because you're not just looking at case studies of what's happened before. You kind of need to know what's going on right now, you know? And sometimes they're reporting on a, a case study that happened and maybe all the money's actually been given and that's done. So people have moved on. So helpful advice now what's working now actually the QGIV blog is one place but there are other those platforms several of them provide really helpful advice about what's working now here's what our data is saying about online giving for instance so and also i subscribe to uh, philanthropy news digest and if you'll just go to that website and uh, enroll yourself on your email Really, there's uh, opportunities to get funding from many, many sources all over the nation. So again, it will help you too with trend spotting. You know? Now, I got online and actually just over a year ago, I did a prospect research uh, webinar uh, and it, everything's really changed. I mean, Google search is the top and it's always been, but all these search engines there's a lot of them today and my message is simply this i i get most everything from google search but sometimes i can't find some item of information that i know is there and so i'll get on bing or yahoo and i'll try and track it down and a lot of times something about the way i'm phrasing the search inquiry will come up better on these other search engines so you need to um you know, use multiple search engines, but again, Google search is the, the big uh, picture, the biggest one in, of all of them. And it's really, really fabulous. They're all really good. So, but just know there are more than, there's more than Google. So a uh, spreadsheet. So here is something I find, um, certainly the bigger nonprofits that can afford constituent management software platforms, you know, have all of this more or less in one place. But I find a lot of nonprofits, certainly in Austin, in fact, most of the nonprofits in the world today are actually smaller nonprofits. They're not those big ones. And so they may have just gotten going on their own independently from a great idea, and now they're catching up with their technology. But it may be that they're housing all their uh, donor data in a gift processing platform in the back end of that. Or they might have it all in MailChimp or something like that. So 
you might have to pull these sources into one. I say just export it in Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets and um, just kind of reformat that to make the typeface a little bit bigger so you can really read it and merge everything into that if you can. I know that it, these things come from various sources. So um, again, if you're using a constituent management software platform where everything's integrated, that's gonna be an easier process for you to do. But if it's not, don't worry because you're gonna find some promising prospects if you'll do it this way. So I merge everything into one and you might code it like if you, this came, this entry came from MailChimp. This entry came from QGIF. This entry came from ZT, you know, whatever it is. And that is because inevitably you're gonna to wanna to go back and go, where did I, where did I have this person down before? So just code it there. And then I remove unnecessary columns. You know, you do need their full name as best you can, their address, mailing address, their email address, and anything you think is really essential, but don't get so many columns that it's just so huge. It's uh, not worth uh, doing that. Then grab a cup of coffee and start reading it. And this is gonna take quiet time. This is somebody like me, I'm a borderline introvert and um, kind of, introvert, extrovert on the line there, but man, there's nothing I like better than sitting quietly and reading and just becoming a detective and finding a great prospect. <laughs> I think it's like great fun, you know, but that might just be me being a slightly introverted person. But so if you're looking at the email, look at the domain name to see, you'll just go through and see if you could come up at and .com, netsuite.com communitiesfoundationtexas.org. Look and see who's actually on your list getting your information. And that uh, can be a real uh, important way to identify a prospect or somebody who's watching what you're doing. Uh, Gmail and those kinds of platforms like hotmail.com, et cetera, they can be challenging because it's just everybody's at gmail.com. But if you see the name in front of the domain and it rings any bells, obviously I made this up, Bill Gates at gmail.com because he's probably got hot mail, frankly, but, um, or Outlook, apologies. <laughs> so uh, so you're, you just kind of need to check it out. Read each one of them. I've actually was on a board for five years of a renewable energy nonprofit nationally. And they had a lot of federal grants and they wanted to move toward private sector fundraising. So I said, give me your list of who's getting your email. So I just went through it one day and I said, okay, look at these companies. Here we go. There's a lot of people we need to reach out to them and see and see if we can work our way up the giving ladder that way, get introductions that are more meaningful because clearly they've been on the email list for a while. So you can do it that way. Again, just take the time to look and check out those uh, domains. So uh, what I do, I get on Google search and I'm, I look on the email and then if I found the company or the organization, the domain, I'll get on there and I'll start looking around there. And um, that'll lead me naturally to what are they supporting as a company? Uh, what are projects are being uh, focused on by the employees? Because today so many uh, corporate sponsors uh, really follow the guidelines and the interests of their employees. I mean, what they want matters. So you need to pay attention to that. So I'm monitoring those and I'm highlighting them to say, okay, I need to go back. And then jumping just a little ahead, when you feel comfortable doing it, you might reach out to that person or two at that company and say, look, you've been on our list for a couple of years now. Um, we have a project and we'd like to see if maybe your company would like to partner with our nonprofit on that. Would, can you help me find the right person to speak with or can you help me with that? Here is my thought, though, back again to the way corporations are focusing more and more on what their employees uh, prefer. And that is, don't forget the person you may need to speak 
with, maybe the person you are emailing, don't always think, oh, well, it's not that person. I need to jump up to the CEO. It, it's not going to work quite that way. Courtesy counts and everyone matters. I know you know that, but it could be that person you're emailing has influence and will you know, vote for your nonprofit to receive support and a partnership of some kind. So just keep aware of that. But also the other thing I did want to mention is um, they may have been on the list for a while, but I get very excited when I find a prospect like this and I immediately just think millions of dollars are going to come <laughs> and you need to, to go slow. You know, it's like I get so excited, but it's you need to understand they're not quite there yet. They are in the loop and they're moving. You can move them forward, but it's not uh, necessarily going to be um, a quick uh, response or whatever. So uh, zip code search. One time I did this in Austin. I was amazed. What are the wealthiest zip codes in your city? It'll come up. Then go back to your spreadsheet and look up and see if you can find those zip codes. And then you can kind of hone down on who those people are. If they're in the news, they have nonprofits they're working with, topics they're interested in, kind of work backward through that. One thing I would simply say here though, is some uh, who may have lived in the same house for many years uh, may not be in a wealthy zip code. So uh, some people are house rich and they're cash poor as well. So there are things that will, not make a zip code search all that helpful, but sometimes it really will. And sometimes those people may be in a wealthy zip code and they may not be able to give a whole lot, but they could sure help introduce you to others. So you need to research uh, those options and just be you know, mindful. Now, once you begin doing this, you're gonna be uh, honing down on prospects and they'll start coming through. Again, donors and influencers are both important and you're gonna build your mental database as well as, well as your uh, organization's database um, with really terrific information from this, but document everything and just you have to focus and be patient and not be interrupted a lot in your work. So your director needs to let you have that time. Now, three cases I'm gonna mention today. Uh, what the first one is actually uh, a group I worked with in South Texas, Central and South Texas. And I literally just pulled up the Excel spreadsheet with the mailing addresses in this case. And I was going through it and I thought, you know, I have to see who's even here, who's even getting the information, you know, maybe I need to expand my mailing, my mailing list. So what I found was somebody whose name I recognized and they were serving on a family foundation board. So they were just giving $25 a year, a membership, a basic membership. So uh, I pulled them out though and passed them along to the powers that be. And once they were properly approached, cultivated, educated and um, the like, they helped us get $5 million from uh, their family foundation. I would say this is totally worth my entire time of three years of <laughs> this nonprofit was that one little gem, $25 a year, five million. What can I say? It's great. Here's one for Dallas and for those that are in North Texas. This is the uh, 90s when I was working with Dallas Zoological Society. And at that time, it was pretty much bombed out organization. Uh, we couldn't find any donor records, yet we had to raise, you know, $21 million or something to expand um, the exhibits and to improve the Dallas Zoo. So I was really chagrined. I thought it was going to be easier than this when I got on board. It was just really a shambles, the entire situation there. So I was out with my pad and paper copying down the names of the donors from the plaques on the exhibits. It was that bad. <laughs> so I did meet with a few of those prior donors and they were pretty unhappy. They had given generous gifts, meaningful gifts. And uh, no one had communicated with them for five years at all. They just took the money and they ran with it. So we did repair those 
relationships. But what I ended up doing was we had 100 plus board members and I didn't know really who they were very much. Uh, I thought I would try and find out who they were by doing this project. So I printed a list up of, I got primary area foundations that I could figure out and all the companies I listed, board members and executive staff everywhere. And I put it into a uh, hard copy document, printed up at a coffee shop, put a cover letter on it, sent it back to each person to their homes with a pen and a return envelope with the postage paid already. And I said, if you wouldn't mind, just, you know, we want to see if you know anyone, we're going to keep this list confidential and this information. You don't have to make a call. If you'd like to make a call, we'd love that. But if not, just you know, say a few kind words, whatever you want, just let us know, but we need to develop a more robust prospect list. So we, what we discovered through this is that our board members weren't major gift donors necessarily themselves, but they did know a lot of people who were. They had gone to high school with people who had become CEOs of major companies, for instance. So I say, put your board members to work. I'm not a fan of what some nonprofit advisors would say, that is everybody give, get off, get out of here. You have to be somebody with influence and big money to be on the board. You know, a lot of people know people of influence who can make big gifts, even if they can't. And so you need to be a little more flexible with that and thoughtful because you're missing out if you don't. So you can create your own prospect list from scratch Again, as with anything cultivation is required, you're going to need to put them on a, uh, a newsletter list and keep them informed and on and on. But basically, it's possible. Here's one in Austin. I helped an emergency response nonprofit uh, create its first real office with a paid staff member. It's been doing everything with volunteers. It was re it's really a great group still today. And they had kept an Excel spreadsheet and it had about 60 records on it. Uh, and it just listed the name, the donation, the mailing address, email if they had it. Very simple, but pretty thorough. And I went through that and it really just took me just about a day to be honest. And I found out um, that we had an important family foundation board member who made a personal gift of $100. And I found a billionaire in another city who had given $100. So we needed to um, get them going and see if we couldn't approach them for larger gifts. So one thing we did have in the situation is, and that was my job was, to do 60 snail mail real thank you letters because no one had been thanked. It had been just a little over a year. So we needed to acknowledge those really big time. The other thing this group had done uh, had gotten on GoFundMe to raise money. So it was, uh, I don't know, you know, with GoFundMe at that time, uh, they wouldn't allow direct access to the donor emails. You could get kind of the name and part of the email. So I literally got on there and with 80 donors, I hand thanked them because they hadn't really been thanked or updated on GoFundMe. I couldn't pull the list off and mail them letters um, or anything like that, or even email them letters. I had to go through GoFundMe. So it took a long time, but it was totally worth it. And then we reformatted our GoFundMe page to make it an update page. like every couple of weeks. Oh, here's an update. Here's what we're doing. We're going to get on eye contact now. If you'd like to join our mailing list, here is our new, um, you know, address to do that from our website on and on and on. And on. So uh, we did have to thank everyone, but what we did was we really got people engaged again. We updated them, which I find over and over in Major Gift and other campaigns. The problem nonprofits have is they think they just don't have time to thank those donors or bring them into the fold by educating them. That's the key issue there. So um, make sure you've thanked everyone and make sure everybody's receiving information. And if you have to get on GoFundMe and just communicate there, definitely do that and make it come alive. So uh, that really, really helped and it really propelled this organization forward. So 
Now, library and other resources. As we all know, Candid is the parent organization of the Foundation Center Online Directory and GuideStar. And we can get that in person by going to the library, if your library is now open after COVID. And um, the Foundation Center is just this incredible, if you don't know it already, it's a fabulous resource and probably the most powerful database of its kind in the world, in my opinion. But what I found during COVID, this is news, um, so grateful for this, but you can access uh, that database online if you have an e-card. Here in Austin, it's called an e-card. It may be something else at your local library, but basically it's expensive to subscribe yourself, your organization to the foundation center directory, you're, you know, by yourself. So I normally would go in person and just sit there. It's to me, that's a pleasure to go to the Austin Public Library and do that. But you can um, access it remotely. And that's what I've been doing lately. And for $22 instead of you know several hundred dollars, <laughs> it's, it's totally worth it. So my annual e-card, that's part of my regular um, business expenses now. It's really terrific. And to find a library location, of course, you can see that. This is places resource centers that have access available to the public for the Foundation Center Online uh, Library. So I did do that search for North Texas, and these are the places that do have uh, access to the Foundation Center. What I like about it, whether you're at working from home remotely with an e-card or if you're there on site, is you can search on that database, you know, the arts, Dallas or performance, Fort Worth, and it will generate results from your search. You can then PDF that search result and you can email it to yourself at home or your office. So uh, I can just download it in my case to my files for my project. So this is really convenient. I noticed that there are not any uh, resource centers for the Foundation Center online uh, database in Fort Worth. So, but again, hypothetically, you could do this by uh, having an e-card from the Austin Public Library. It's all remote, everyone's remote. So check uh, your local resources for that. It's totally worth it. This is powerful, wonderful information and I highly recommend it. Now, if you're going to really raise lots of money, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, I think you might want to consider Wealth Reading. So what this will do, it will take your Excel spreadsheets, very simple, straightforward. You know, if you, you have that or if that you have an integration with Wealth Engine or iWave or something like that through your constituent management platform, uh, either way, a uh, simple Excel spreadsheet will do it. So it will help narrow your search for promising prospects. And what they do is they have a variety of publicly available databases for say real estate stocks, for like GuideStar board positions, um, that type of thing, auto, auto uh, or vehicle ownership, that type of thing. And they'll run it you're through all of those databases and pull up the results. And once you get those results, you can then go through them and you'll find there are probably a lot of people that uh, might be good prospects for you, people you need to cultivate and then ask for gifts who are not names in the news necessarily. So I like it because I've done this three times for major gift campaigns. And I can tell you what, it turned all the prospects research on its head and we refocused off of people we thought would give it was a whole new set of people and that was really welcome news in our case so uh spoiler alert now if people have privately held companies and of course many do uh you can't uh really find information about them this way you'll have to do it in another fashion by asking friends of friends or professionals about that um, I once had a uh, prospect in South Texas who I knew was worth hundreds of millions because I knew some of their um, 
close friends and um, but no hard information. All that came up from the wealth screening for this person with a privately held company was that they had a car that was valued at $25,000 and that was it. So what can you say? It doesn't do everything, but it'll do a lot. So now some resources for you, research and screening. I kind of mixed them all up here. But um, if you join TechSoup, which is free of charge, you have to be a nonprofit to join, but you can get a discount on several different platforms that can help you with research. And Flux is one of those, GrantStation is another one of those. So get the discount, whatever you can, get an e-card from the library and get a TechSoup uh, discount on your platforms here. Uh, there are some that are free, of course, like you can um, certainly, um, do uh, uh, what state of Texas here, Grantsmanship Center, grants.gov. There's an app for grants.gov. So um, you can get a lot of this for free, but basically I would just say, uh, set up a demo, check out the site, see what you think. Since I last uh, spoke on this topic, just over a year ago, as I mentioned, there are new faces here. Instrumental is really coming on strong windfall I didn't know about until recently. I have uh, uh, worked with Wealth Engine several times, as I mentioned earlier, but um, I have taken an iWave demo and I'm really impressed with that. It's real clean looking, easy to read, really easy to use, it appears anyway. So uh, get get the demo and see. It, it may totally be worth it. I would say actually that if you'll do well screening in advance of a major gift campaign, that that will be better for your nonprofit than a feasibility study would be because uh, you're already going to know kind of who's back there and who you need to work on to receive major gifts. So um, that is just something you might think about. Now, the other sources for funding today, as we all know, donor advised funds are very, very popular with donors. They make life, life easy for them. It's very secure way for donors to be uh, giving. So I would say uh, check your community foundation website for uh, funds that they're holding, deadlines, general grants a lot of times they have, uh, and check on bank websites and uh, you know adv professional advisor investment house type websites. Uh, I am actually on one of those right now and I searched on arts in Austin <laughs> and came up with a lot of great pros prospects that way. So they're, they're not necessarily going to be entities, philanthropists that appear as a separate website online or anything like that. Uh, so what I do though, I just say, if you'll get on GuideStar, like it'll say, okay, well, great. So I've got five prospects here. Of foundations, so I'll be able to apply online to this uh, to this bank. Say, and uh, basically, I look at the tax return. I'll search on GuideStar just to be sure, because I'm, you know, it's like you don't want to waste a whole lot of time doing a lot of the posts that aren't really fitting for a prospect. But you never know. So I did that actually this week. Looked on GuideStar, and I thought bingo, this does look like a good prospect and I'm going to go ahead and apply. So they'll have, of course, the online links to apply and all that, but it's a whole nother level. And I think this is probably going to keep increasing uh, donor advice funds every single year, more and more donors turn to uh, donor advice funds and to um, community foundations, banks and all that. So just be sure to check the banks and your community foundations, wealth of information, and maybe I'll just go ahead and give it a try. So to recap, you can do a lot yourself. Take the time to review your own list for hidden gems, and even a small list can yield dramatic results. A lot of times people think, oh, I'll read the newspaper, and hey, it's Michael Dell or Bill Gates. They, they'll fund it. They have a lot of money. I hear that from board members who really mean well, but you know, of course, that's not not going to work. That kind of a kind of thinking. And a lot of times, there's a gem right in your 
donor database right now or your mailing list right now that you just need to take them to the next level. So um, it's like being a detective, you know, you want to use ethically sourced information that's publicly available. And um, I would also say you don't need a consultant to do this. You just need that mindset that I mentioned at the outset. You know, you need to just be focused, you need quiet time, you need to document and read often. News is helpful. Uh, certainly the financial news is the most helpful in my opinion, but um, see what's going on. Keep kind of keep abreast of what's happening and um, always your brain is amazing. Use it. Now, security, I want to close with that. Um, if you do a well screening, for instance, or, it, you know, if the information you research is a year old, like we had pre-COVID, but then we had COVID. Some people managed just fine through COVID financially, but some, some of them did not. So you're going to need to start over. Uh, well screening is not something that's just good one time and it's done because people's Fates, their investments, everything changes. So I would say if you have hard copy, shred it. If you're uh, keeping that stuff in the cloud, you might want to, you know, remove that over time. Keep all your research results secure and confidential and clear your computer's browsing history routinely. If you're going to do this a lot, you might invest in a virtual privacy network VPN uh, to um, to help protect you, you just don't, you wanna protect your donors. You're doing good work. You're supporting a social good, a non, great nonprofit and has a wonderful mission. So your goal is a positive one, but people out there on the internet and hackers and, and all don't have those same positive motives. So you have to be careful. We also need to respect that some people have paid professionals remove as much as possible. They have paid people to do it. And I have seen that happen over and again. So you may, again, I mentioned that earlier, you need to ask uh, professional colleagues and um, conduct verbal research and you can see friends of friends, see what might happen. You might be striking out in the dark a little bit, but it works. I've, that has worked fine for me in the past. Also, I wanted to mention this because they actually do have a branch up in North Texas, the APRA, Association of Professional Researchers for Advancement. In my opinion, the way we are going with data and how important data has become to actually being an effective nonprofit and meeting your mission really, really on target is uh, this, this, I think, is an association that needs to grow. We all need to be members of it because this is for researchers and it is about data and so there's your north texas link and also the home organizational link you do not hear much about this group uh, but i think it's probably one that we all need to be paying attention to and uh, help it grow over time especially in our tech club now so there you go so that's those are my thoughts and that's my email and here's my blog you can also join our tech club nonprofit tech club austin it's all free of charge we have a facebook group page or the new tech soup connect uh, link on bevy lab so you can join our programs as well they're all free and eli helps us we're real grateful for that but and gene is going to be speaking this summer i can hardly wait for that but there you go and I'll post these slides Thanks. on my slide share as well. Thanks so much, Carolyn. That was excellent. I love the, the be curious, be creative, <laughs> use the resources you have. Um, the next event on our side is June 16th and it'll be how to find the right consultant for your nonprofit. So whether you register via the meetup or register via the new Bevy system, the new platform that we're migrating to, you'll be in the right place and be able to attend. So we hope to see everybody on June 16th. Thanks, Carolyn. Bye, thanks. Talk to you later. Bye.